um, institution, the, the factors that really play into this is uh, volume of brain disease and whether they have extracranial disease. How many brain metastases do they have? How big are the brain metastases? We discuss it in a multidisciplinary team meeting. We know the response rate with single agent BRAF inhibitor. We're about to see the response rate with combination BRAF MEC. We've got two or three ongoing studies looking at Nevo IPI and Nevo alone in brain metastases. We need that data to really help us, but it ends up being a multidisciplinary approach. So in our institution, for example, if you have low volume but several, so oligometastatic in the brain, we would even consider Nevo IPI in that situation only if the radiation oncologist and the brain surgeon are there ready with us. But I'm talking small, we're talking sort of very sub-centimetre and, and um, not symptomatic, um, and watch and see how you go. If it's a little more, 10, 15, they're BRAF mutants, some are hitting 15 millimetres or more, targeted therapies. Um, so it really, there are no rules except to say that it's driven by the volume, the size and the number and the, the state of the extracranial disease. But it's multi-modality treatment. And even if you start on targeted therapy and they've got multiple, let's say 10 mm -hmm. to 15, you know that you're gonna probably end up doing either surgery or stereotactic down the, tra the, the, the track. It's gonna be combination and sequencing just to keep them alive really for as long as possible. So if you can, can I just throw out yeah. sort of another, another question then, and again, I'm sure Georgina and her colleagues think about this and talk about this is the other question in these scenarios is whether or not it makes sense to start with targeted therapy as a debulking strategy and whether or not you can convert someone over to the scenario where you think immune therapy would work. And again, a place where unfortunately we just don't have any data at this point from clinical trials and it's actually very challenging to design that clinical trial. I think that's sort of another question we get asked very commonly about these patients. And it's not just about brain, it's for extracranial yeah. too and that is, you know, can you treat get things under control, symptoms under control for a short period of time, then switch to immunotherapy. Again, data-free zone, uh, don't have data to actually drive the decision making. We do know that patients with a very, very extraordinarily high LDH are not gonna do well on anything, but K, can we bring it down with targeted therapy and then come in with immunotherapy where they've got a more normalized LDH, will that make a difference? It's actually the subject of some neoadjuvant approaches in looking at sequencing to get best tumor control. But it's a data-free zone, but it's very provocative and very compelling, actually, to want to do that. Yeah, back to the brain metastases again. Um, as you said, Georgina, also, so many of these patients, then if they are not symptomatic and they have low volume disease, it appears to be reasonable to consider starting it either with a, a potential combination, um, immunotherapy versus a BRF mech. Now, is there any concern that if they were to develop symptoms and you have to do radiation for them, if you are either on immunotherapy or on a BRF mech combination in terms of the potential effect of that radiation on the brain? Great, great question. So um, clinical experience and some larger case reports tell us that you can safely give radiotherapy in combination with targeted therapy. Um, also, you can treat bulky brain disease with just targeted therapy and then hold off your radiotherapy until you've seen things reduce a bit. So we know that that's, um, from clinical experience, uh, safe to give. The issue with the immune therapies is does immune therapy combined, for example, with stereotactic radiosurgery increase the rate of radionecrosis? There is a background rate of radionecrosis with stereotactic radiosurgery, and that's going to be answered with trials that hopefully we'll read out next year. You know, what is the rate of patients who start with Ipinevo let's say BRAF wild type, start with ipinevo, so I'm going off this case, but start with ipinevo, um, seem to have a response, but maybe three shrink, one grows, cut it out if it's of size that the neurosurgeon can cut it out and it's not in an area of the brain that matters. But what if I give stereotactic radiosurgery to it? Am I going to sort of give them a 50% chance of getting radionecrosis, 70%, or is it only 30% chance? That will be answered next year, but these are the questions we really need to understand. I must say now, it, when your hands are tied and people have brain metastasis and you've got to manage it, you give it and you, you watch and monitor and yeah. treat expectantly. Yeah. Mike, I just, yeah, I just want to add that I think when we're talking about radiation, I think we're really specifically talking about stereotactic yes. radiosurgery and I mm -hmm. think that's an important distinction and even in patients with a lot of brain metastasis that may not be amenable to stereotactic radiosurgery with the rise of the immune therapies that we have, particularly the BRAF and MEK inhibitors and their proven efficacy in the brain and emerging data about immune checkpoint inhibition in the brain. I really find that for whole brain radiotherapy, we really need to be thinking about that as a subsequent type of a step and that starting these patients with 
initial systemic therapy and or potentially radio surgery at particular time points in, in combination, rep, understanding that we don't have all the data we really want about the toxicities. I think that needs to be thought of first and that really whole brain radiotherapy is, is moving kind of to the background and, and I would say we really only want to think about that after we've tried all these approaches and particularly if a patient is very well controlled in the extracranial compartment. I guess the one other point to this, though, is, and again, with Mike Postow here, talking about this possibility of radiation therapy potentially boosting the efficacy of immunotherapy. And so this idea of actually, again, if you had a patient that you're treating with immune therapy, is there any rationale where you look to actually try to find sort of a lesion that would be amenable to radiation to try to get sort of, a, again, a boost to your immune response, as, as you described in a, in a very notable case report? So it's, a, it's an interesting idea, I guess I would say, and, and, and the theory is that if you radiated a tumor, would that cause some magical anti-tumor effects that would then potentially synergize with checkpoint blockade? And I think I, I would like to be very clear that we have no proof in patients yet that radiation increases the efficacy of checkpoint blockade. So I would say that we should not be radiating tumors with the idea that we're doing that to increase the efficacy of checkpoint blockade. That is. Uh, information that we would need from a randomized trial, which unfortunately we don't have yet. So if a patient has a need for radiation anyways, I think it's justified because they have a need for radiation anyways. And retrospective series suggested it may be safe to do that. But we don't have prospective data to suggest in patients that radiating something increases the efficacy of checkpoint blockade. That has been shown in mouse models, and I think we're hoping that it may be true in patients, but again, we're not to that point just quite yet. So it's really about radiating people who have a need for radiation anyways. I'd agree with that. And, and just talking about <coughs> prospective data, there is a retrospective data that suggests, suggests, because it's retrospective, that radiotherapy combined with PD-1 to the site you give radiotherapy, and it's, again, it's only mm -hmm. in areas that need it, okay, so progressing lesions, have a much higher response rate than what you would see with PD-1 alone, or are progressing on PD-1 and irradiate, have a nice response rate, up near 40% in progressing lesions. However, the scopal effect of other tumor sites, other metast metastatic sites shrinking, we have not seen that in the clinic. But certainly the site of radiotherapy does have some synergism clinically, but only at that site. So I think one of the relevant clinical scenarios is that we've seen patients, whether they're responding to targeted therapy or immunotherapy, present with an isolated lesion that's progressing. And again, the brain being sort of a common site for this. And the brain being a place where we often then will use something like stereotactic radiosurgery to treat that lesion. But if the other lesions, again, are responding at that point, it's very reasonable to continue that treatment, even though technically patients have responded in the brain, that we're still trying to understand why this happens. But there can be potentially a different biology and immunology of melanoma in the brain versus other places in the body. And again, this is a, an area that uh, is in desperate need of, of both uh, translational and clinical research but this idea of, again, do we need specific therapies specifically con to control melanoma uh, once it's spread to the brain, which may be distinct from what you need to control it outside the brain, is, is still sort of an open question.